Digital Artcast is proudly sponsored by Procreate, the most advanced painting app ever designed for a mobile device. We'll be discussing the app a little later in the episode, as well as giving away a free copy. But for now, let's get started. Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to Digital Artcast, uh, another episode and another interview. Um, this time I am joined by a very special guest. Um, now I say very special because obviously a lot of the guys I got on this podcast are special, but um, this particular guest um, was one of the first people uh, I emailed back in the day, like 2010, 2009, um, about why I should leave my job and go be an art uh, artist uh, or a concept artist, um, Mr. Matt Gazer. So uh, thanks for joining me, Matt. Say hello. Yeah, yeah, Neil. Uh, pleasure, bud. I mean, uh, we've known each other for uh, quite a few years now, and uh, just an honor to be here and and uh, to help uh, help you through your journey as an yeah, artist. Yeah, yeah so. definitely. All those times ago when uh, when you got your first uh, email from a guy called Gordon Neil, and you you're saying to yourself, "Oh, yeah, who's this?" And uh, thinking no, you'd never get, <laughs> you'd never get back to me, and then eventually the email came back. So. Um, which was at the time was quite a lengthy response. It was, I think, I asked maybe three or four questions, but um, I think it was you know a couple of pages worth of a, a, a email back to me, just basically laying out what you thought would be the best path forward for my career. But yeah, yeah, and, and I think at the time you you were um, you were working at a train uh, on a train or something like that as a conductor or no, it was uh, it was uh, you're half right. Yeah, I was working for the railway in the UK. Oh, the railway, yeah. Yeah, but I was uh, an engineer, so I fixed a lot of their um, telecom stuff, the phones and stuff. So um, yeah, yeah, that was that was a while back. So that was a while back, and then uh, yeah, you you were you were just uh, trying to you know um, figure figure it out, and mm. uh, I just was there to help you get inspired i suppose yeah, definitely <laughs> and uh and, and clearly it's, it's been working so yeah yeah it's awesome yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so uh for people who don't know matt because at this point you know um you be modest obviously you'll say that you don't have any fans but i'm sure people do know but if they don't um who is matt gazer and what does matt gazer do for a living <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I i am a concept artist and um i for people that don't know what that is, although it'd be really weird if you're listening to this. Yeah. You're <laughs> uh, a concept artist is a person that uh, just generates uh, visual development. That, in other words, uh, illustrations, sketches, paintings of characters, vehicles, environments, and and worlds for uh, video games, entertainment projects, and movies. Yeah. So awesome. Um, but um, but I I do that, and. Um, I, I would call myself more of a concept artist than an art director, although I have art directed in the, in the past on various projects. Um, mm. I think, um, uh, you know, across the board, I've done more just concept art uh, yeah. over the years, and I'm fine with that. I'd rather create than be in meetings all day, and uh, yeah. I really admire art directors that uh, can, can do both, but um, I just love to just... You know, get my nose to the grindstone and and, and, and make create stuff, stuff make yeah. stuff. So that's that's more my path. Yeah, because I think art directors are more just managers of artists, um, less. They, more, yeah. Yeah, they are, and 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 some more than others. Like I have an art director right now who likes to paint on top of my work, and mm -hmm. uh, and that that that's a rare technique. Um, yeah. But it's also very useful, and and in a way, he gets to own the piece too. When we're done, it's like you know. We've worked on this thing together in a way, and mm. uh, and so I think that's good for him and me. I I get to, I and, and also he's um, a little older than me, and he's from Pixar, and so I'm I feel like I'm I'm getting <laughs> I'm getting some classes out of this too, but I'm yeah. also getting paid to do some some work for them. So um, yeah. you never stop learning. I'll yeah. say that right now. Awesome, so. awesome. So obviously now you mentioned stuff at Pixar, but. Um, you know that's the higher echelon, but where was your beginning in the industry? Where did you start from? Um, I started my humble beginnings where I grew up in Northern California, and uh, just coming out of uh, high school, um, I got a summer school um, uh, sort of internship thing uh, at at uh, animation uh, school called CalArts, and mm. it was a summer where you get to just study. 
uh, animation, and I quickly learned in that summer that I do not want to be an animator. Um, <laughs> so uh, even though I did apply to that school, I didn't get in for mm-hmm. thank goodness. And yeah. so that I realized I was more of an illustrator and more of a, a ska- like to draw. And mm-hmm. so then um, I set my sights for the most expensive art school I could find, and that was Art Center. And uh, <laughs> I got in, and um, I'll speed through that. It was just a great experience. Um, mm-hmm. Met some great friends who now are obviously really doing really well these days, and yeah. um, uh, through all different facets of of art, like mm-hmm. uh, children's books, movies, uh, everything, video games. Um, friend of mine's now a, my roommate, uh, Glenn Rain, is now an art director at Blizzard. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some friends of mine, uh, Dan Santata is a, is a really famous, well known. Uh, uh, award-winning uh, children's book illustrator and, and author, yeah. um, you know, and guys like this, you know, Pete Pete Brown is also really talented. Oh yeah, in that. yeah, yeah. Um, Peter Brown, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Um, he did uh, a Curious Garden, which is really famous. And yeah. and uh, but anyway, so yeah, um, I, I I out of school, I ended up just before I, I graduated, I ended up getting an, uh, an internship at uh, Klasky Chupo at the time, which was an affiliate of Nickelodeon, and um, I was tasked with uh, three months that summer, right before I graduated uh, Art Center, to do uh, background and prop design. Uh, for Rugrats, the animated series, and yeah. um, I had a really always find hilarious because that was one of the things I grew up watching. So, <laughs> oh, okay, there, there you go. Yeah, and uh, and I was just an incredible experience working in a real studio. Mm. Um, I will say, and I kind of hinted this to you yesterday when we were chatting a little bit that um, even though I had that gig, that little mm. short uh, experience after graduating, I figured I could just roll over to Rugrats, knock on their door, and hey, yeah. You know, uh, can I get a job? And uh, they just don't create jobs out of thin air, obviously. So I learned yeah. that lesson. But um, after six months of really searching, um, th- I finally got my first real job as a, a video game concept artist on the on the Lord of the Rings Two Towers video game, and that that um, forced me to move up to the San Francisco Bay Area from LA. Yeah. And I've been around here ever since in the mm-hmm. Bay Area. And uh, yeah, I just worked in video games for five years, ended up going to mm-hmm. uh, Lucasfilm Animation as a concept artist for them uh, on the Clone Wars animated series. And then I uh, broke off that to do some more Blue Sky projects with some friends who d- had a startup video game company. Mm-hmm. And then um, long story short, I that, that tanked and I ended up doing freelance and I've been a freelance concept artist ever since. Mm-hmm. So there's my, my, my journey in a yeah. nutshell. <laughs> and just... Uh... A, a quick ask because this is obviously me as well because I'm, I'm I'm geeking out here but um, you know you got to basically work at Lucas now even with ILM you know floating about just now it seems like the the top tier echelon of jobs for concept guys what was your experience working even on the Clone Wars series you know was that like a dream come true for you Star Wars wise because obviously I think most people yes. are fans so <laughs> yes I <laughs> I mean, I grew up uh, in you know where the, where we had redwood forests in our backyard, pretending to be Ewoks. Uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I was I was born in the era of Return of the Jedi, not yeah. Empire and uh, and the original Star Wars movie, but uh, New Hope. But um, so so to be uh, where it all began, and yeah. I I mean I remember when I was in high school, my um, my mom bought me this uh, this book about industrial light and magic, and in the first few pages they had a picture of Skywalker Ranch with the you know the the beautiful white house on the yeah. near the vineyards and stuff yeah. and uh and then all of a sudden i'm working there and i'm hanging out <laughs> there and, and it was just such a weird weird experience at first um yeah. but I, uh, people were super amazing that my my colleagues that i met there i'm still friends with today we helped generate the battle milk series art yeah. art books mm-hmm. um and uh one two and three mm-hmm. and uh you know I, I just got a lot of great uh contacts out of that um yeah. And uh, I'll never, and I think all of us will never forget those days at Skywalker Ranch because um, after being there for about a year, they moved us to a different location, mm-hmm. still close to Skywalker Ranch, but it was the Big Rock Ranch, and it was, yeah. it, although still beautiful, it was, uh, it wasn't as nostalgic and more corporate. Yeah. And, uh, and the the real reason why I left is because um, I. And this happens a lot in big studios. They end up uh, finding how you know a certain area that you're really good at, and they'll just keep you there and doing that all the time. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I, in my personal work and my freelance projects at that at that time, I was mm. I was generating a really different type of work. And and so my my friends were were suggesting uh, I should join them outside of the uh, Lucas. And mm. so I, I left. And people thought I was crazy, but. Uh, <sighs> Uh, you know, hey, you know, sometimes you have to be crazy to yeah. do something. 
Yeah. It's just a it's a growth thing. I think when you feel stagnated in your position, you really want to try and keep continuing to grow. And I think if things are too easy or you're comfortable, then the growth never happens. Um, I mean, I know. Yeah. Yeah, I think back to a, a more recent guy who who's obviously just he's younger in the industry, but Mark Brunette has been working at Blizzard for um, God since he was seventeen. I think he's he's thirty now, and yeah, <laughs> wow. he, but he left Blizzard last year um, as one of their character guys to start his own company, Cube Brush. I don't know if you've heard of it, and it's a no. it's a website basically where uh, artists can sell their kind of like Gumroad. They can sell work online, uh, demos, assets, all this kind of stuff. But he set it up. Um, and he found while he was at Blizzard, you know, he was balancing running Cube Brush and working at Blizzard. And then eventually he was, you know, he didn't want to split his time anymore. He wanted to chase his own dream. So he left Blizzard to go run Cube Brush, which has become super successful now. Um, but then again, a lot of people were saying, oh, I mean, you're nuts. You're leaving Blizzard. I mean, like, apart from, you know, like ILM, like Blizzard is one of the other, you know, top echelon things based in California. It's an Irvine. It's a huge studio. They make massive games. Um, yeah. But he wanted to do his own thing. So, you know. Power yeah, I mean, like, like my art director right now um, on the client project I'm on, um, uh, he was an art director at, at uh, Pixar, and um, I got to know him because I was trying to get to, into Pixar around the same time I was trying to get into Lucasfilm, and uh, I didn't get into Pixar, but I, I had many luncheons with this guy, and he was about on his way out, and he was – in in all the right suggestions, he was saying you don't want to work here, and yeah. and uh, and I, I I finally after going through all that, um, I realized you know that uh, big corporations um, like DreamWorks and Pixar and, and are, just don't really uh, resonate with me. Uh, working a full time desk job there, yeah. I'm so much more comfortable freelance. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, and ultimately, um, the same person I'm talking about, um, is, is kind of, uh, he's a contractor. He's not really a full-time guy either. So he right. just bounces around and consults and art directs. And so, yeah, I mean, we all, we all go through this phase, I think, uh, starting out where it's just so enticing to work for the big box names, yeah. working on big, sexy movies and everything. Yeah. And, uh, when it comes down to it, you just want to work on stuff that resonates with you, whether it's um, really flashy or not. And uh, yeah. that's where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, no. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, then, and then also back to being comfortable mm-hmm. um, or not, uh, I was um, asked a couple years ago to start doing uh, stage design and uh, uh, event uh, design for uh, EDM concerts in uh, in uh, Europe, yeah. and specifically uh, uh, Brussels, Belgium. Mm-hmm. And at the time when they when they came to me, I as a freelance guy, I had never done anything like this, and um, it, it, the amount of volume of work that they were asking me to do was so astronomical. Yeah. Uh, I was so afraid, uh, <laughs> and going <laughs> into it, I had no idea what I was doing, even though they were. They were um, coaching me a little bit here and there, yeah. but uh, but now I'm on my fourth year doing it, and um, the the experience is unbelievable, and it's such an incredible way to um, connect with with people dancing and music uh, through mm-hmm. through my through my designs, and so yeah. um, you know the hard work of of doing something you were comfortable with has paid off. So that that that's something we can all learn from, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's it's, I mean, cause it's so. I mean, it's still design, it's still illustration, but it's it's no tied to an industry that's typically associated with them. So games or movies or TV it was a music festival. Um, for people who don't know, obviously, um, I can see the picture right behind Matt because we're video calling, but um, if you oh. didn't know, yeah, yeah. Uh, the festival was the Daydream Festival, yeah? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, yeah. It's uh, It takes place in April every year, and uh, it's like 65,000 people. Wow. Um, uh, and then they have DJs uh, come from all over the world, and uh, and you you camp for two days, mm-hmm. and um, and you just rock out. And they have um, it's kind of a carnival too. They have all kinds of rides, and they have other tents with other uh, v- venues where people are DJing. But yeah. there's the main event, the main stage, and that's what I I'm a part of. I basically design the poster, mm-hmm. and then we try and make the the world of Daydream. Uh, look at the festival look like the world from the poster so yeah uh so it's 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 really challenging and really creative and mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of fun yeah which is awesome though because the one thing i've admired with your work um the one thing that was initially drawn to apart from the peter pan music on you have to start your website which you got rid of and i hate of <laughs> <laughs> as uh as uh as you your worlds because unlike most artists um you have this foundation underneath your work where you've created this world of 
characters and 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 places that most people you know and that was what came a lot with um with your book um you know when you published it was was an exploration of that world that isn't work you've done for like disney or whatever else it was it was your own um look i look inside your head basically wasn't it yeah yeah and a lot of people um shockingly were really impressed that i had a, just a, a ton of sketches in there um and, and it goes back to um you know layout and and design it all starts with drawing and sketching and and i think that's so important yeah. uh, more in most cases even more important than the, the finished polished painting because yeah. um you're seeing this 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 story of development and creativity and so anyway i tried to emulate a lot of that in the book mm. uh, well and then obviously having paintings and everything else but um but yeah i uh i, I was hoping that people would get a little view of what i'm about in that yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and and to be honest, I over the past fifteen years, I have all these stories and big ideas that I want to develop someday, um, and they're not moving as fast as I want them to. So yeah. I've instead of just hiding them and putting them in a corner in my own room, I decided yeah. to just publish this book and expose it all to everyone. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> so who knows what will come out of that? Maybe yeah. a lot of plagiarism. I don't know, but. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, at least everyone will know the the it came from that book first. So yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but, yes. yeah. but then we had this conversation a while back. I think it was it was even last year where um, you attended an event where people were doing life drawing, but you they were surrounded by antiques instead of paper and pen and or charcoal. Um, and I, I take it is that something you try to champion even with people you teach or or younger students that sketching is still pen and paper is still a big thing for you. Oh yeah, pen and paper is absolutely. Uh, I, I do these uh, Facebook Live things a lot now, where I um, I just have a rig over my desk, and uh, if you were a video, you'd see it right there uh, <laughs> behind my shoulder. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it's really good to just draw. Um, I try and do that. Uh, you know, I do it through my Cintiq all the time, draw and sketch. But it's different. You're you're liberated with um, you know erasing things really fast using the selection tool, moving things around, scaling things. Uh, when you draw a head on a piece of paper, you can't do that. You have to be you're stuck with that scale, and you have mm -hmm. to make, try to make it work. So there's excuse me, there's a lot of um, just thought that goes into a, a real drawing that mm -hmm. uh, y you don't have to that you know you have to commit. And yeah. uh, and I think and I think a lot of ways it forces you to. Um, take more chances more risks mm -hmm. uh uh that and, and be comfortable with it you have yeah. you can't just um erase it and, and unless you do pencil obviously but um uh, that's just a totally different look for me I, I, I the way i draw and sketch is through pen mm -hmm. uh pen and ink and um and I, they're kind of just loose drawings uh line work is really um a secondary it's more just sketching ideas out mm -hmm. you know and then sometimes these things Will turn into uh, painting someday, you know. Yeah. Oh, that's that's a cool. These characters are interesting. Maybe I'll do something with that. So, yeah. and that's that's interesting as well because obviously, um, me myself just studying stuff under Scott Robertson with his book just now how to draw, he champions that at the start where he talks about like never erasing, like because he obviously is also uh, a permanent marker or or biro. Like he he doesn't erase a lot of lines because more I think it's more focused because he's more industrial design, but. Um, I think it's still a good practice again to, to to know be as precious with your artwork, with your lines. If you know, with yeah. a sketchbook, you know, the one thing I got back in the day when I was in um, my early art school days in college, where a lot of guys would buy pristine, brand new sketchbooks with all these fancy leather bound things and all these big white pages, but they would never <laughs> draw on them because they were so afraid to make them messy. And I'm like, that's the whole point of a sketchbook, right? That's you, the the aim is to yeah. make it, yeah, to be free and creative and and find yourself in well, it. I got three things I can say to that. Um, cool. I started out uh, with marker paper, and every drawing page that I finished, I would put it into a portfolio, mm -hmm. uh, not for um, like uh, interviews or anything like that, uh, but just for archiving. What's great is that I I had a sketchbook at the end of this that was just made of pages that I was proud of, yeah. and I'm not afraid if I'm having a bad drawing, I'll just rip it out and throw it away and yeah. if my sketchbook is uh, a quarter of an inch less thick because of it then mm. so what but at least yeah. um I'm, I have a, I have a solid volume of art that I'm proud of. Mm -hmm. uh, other people say hey you know keep the bad drawings in there it's important to look back at them and 
I, I say bullshit because <laughs> uh, I think it's therapeutic to throw away work that you're you're having a bad day on, yeah. and I, I tear it up, and then I I can start back stronger, and I can't reference the piece I just effed yeah. up on, and and uh, feel bad about it, and start fresh. Another thing I do while sketching in pen and ink is something that I think Scott Robinson does and a lot of um, industrial de- designers do is you use a light marker, really like a one or two. Yeah. Uh, and you you experiment what you're trying to create really loosely. Yeah. And then you come back in with your actual line work that's darker mm-hmm. and commit to that. Mm-hmm. And so you have a foundation of pre-experimentation mm-hmm. where you already know where you're going with your drawing and then come in with uh, real line work and, 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 and commit to what you're trying to create. Um, for years, I didn't do that. And, uh, and then it was um, more challenging, but uh, it's not as fun either. If you're loosely creating something and, and you step back and you see the, the, like in the, through the fog, almost something that could be there that you yeah. could, you're, you're creating, it's really inspirational. And then you come back with uh, pen and ink and, and f- finalize it. And you, you're actually, you know, you're on a good path for, for a nice drawing. So. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, even though, you know, you're, we're talking about these basic ideas back in the day of, of drawing and sketching and pages and, you know, but the work you've done so far, you've been able to work with some massive studios and you're freelancing. Um, I mean, there's a big talk in the industry just now where I think basically with the birth of the internet and how quickly things have progressed, there is more people, I think, missing the first step of even working in a studio and people are going straight to freelancing. Do you think that's possibly going to be more the future of, well, specifically 2D concept artists? Because less, because obviously 3D guys still have kind of a place in a studio working, so do you think 2D is going that way? Um, you mean exclusively freelance for, for up and coming artists? Yeah, so going into the field? M- yeah. yeah, more missing out the studio vibe and going probably straight to working from just I, email. I, I, I always preach it's important out of school to try and find a job at a real studio. Um, uh, for two reasons, you will grow faster as an artist because you're surrounded by other talented artists. Um, I learned Photoshop not from... I learned Photoshop at first through a class at Art Center, but um, when I really got to understand the program was when I was around other colleagues working at a video game company, uh-huh. and um, and so I think that is key. Number one is to work for a studio um, first, and then if you want to do freelance later, that's great because you'll already have had built a, a foundation of contacts that you can rely on through working at studios. Yeah. I think if you just start out out of school. And you want to be a freelance artist, um, you are ultimately roadblocked with con- with a, a, a you know a collective of contacts to, that you, that you can choose from. Yeah. Um, you, I guess if you're a rock star and you come out of art center or come out of an art school and you're well known and everyone wants you, you can say, you know, I don't, I'll work with you, but it's under my terms and it's in my studio, yeah. my own studio. Then that's yeah. great. But um, a lot, ninety five percent of us don't have that kind of opportunity, so. Yeah, so you think there's still a, a place for people working in studios initially just to get that that kind of buzz? Yeah, yeah, and I think and and as un un uh, or excuse me as um, unattractive as it can be sometimes working for a mobile game studio, I think there's a dime a dozen of them out there that are that are all looking for artists that are yeah. that have you know skill and talent and and that's just a good place to start because they'll hire you. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So um, if you if you just search for those top quality, top tier AAA companies, uh, you might be, you know, slightly disappointed. Um, and I think that's when you would would really focus on working for a mobile gaming studio. Mm-hmm. So, and and that 15 years ago, when I started out, that wasn't obviously there. So, mm-hmm. uh, I think everyone automatically has a, a huge more uh, greater advantage now than than back when I was trying to look for work. Yeah, so. I mean, especially in Scotland, we have. Um maybe two or three large studios i mean i've just learned recently actually which i never knew that um disney have a studio over here in edinburgh um that do primarily work on film i think and animation which i never knew and i just only found this out um a friend Amazing. of mine yeah a friend of mine was going for an interview for an internship over summer which he got which i was super proud of him for daniel shout out um but he's going to work there over summer at disney um and then obviously i've been interning at axis which are another huge cd studio that um, yeah. outsource stuff um halo league of legends stuff like that and uh there's rockstar obviously in edinburgh that make grand theft auto so i mean 
They're there the, you go. Yeah, the three biggest ones. But then, of course, underneath them is a ton of uh, indie studios that are, are, are blazing the way, and, and not only mobile games, but other things. I mean, even uh, Blazing Griffin is one that's based in Edinburgh as well. Um, a smaller tier studio, but they've made some Emmy Award winning work that uh, is featured all Amazing. over the world. Yeah, so um, I think it probably is. And then is the, stu- a- the studio that did Fable, I think they're in your neck of the woods too, right? Yeah, yeah so uh, Lionhead, which unfortunately now has, there has been disbanded. Um, they, oh, they, I didn't know this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they closed down last year, I think. Um, they oh, were so, so sad. I know, and it happens more and more, but um, yeah, so they, they were working on a project for Microsoft, which got canned which was another fable game um but at the last minute i think microsoft pulled the plug because it wasn't wasn't quite happening but yeah so but I, I, as far as i know a lot of the guys who were there artist wise anyway they did go to other jobs um because they were all super talented guys so um it wasn't, yeah, to- oh, wasn't a total loss when one door closes another one opens man so it does yeah yeah it's hmm. it's all about the journey yeah yeah <laughs> which yeah. is which is why i think i keep telling people because i've been told so many times is that um, you need to be constantly evolving your portfolio even when you're in work because um, you know these things can happen at any time. I've, I've known several studios or people in studios, bigger studios where projects have just ended and uh, people have just been told that day, you know, you won't be here next week. So Yeah, I, I've, I've uh, heard of this um, this sort of practice where the moment you get a job, you're, lo- you're already preparing and looking for your next job. Um, yeah. I don't think to take that literally it just means yeah. um it, you know like you don't the, the first week working at a studio you're already applying for another place no, <laughs> like that. but you're just um uh, constantly in that uh, pre- preparation mode yeah. and uh and updating art on your website mm-hmm. always having a nice book uh portfolio uh, uh you know off on hand that's that's updated too mm-hmm. never never uh getting too comfortable with work that you're highly um uh, excited about that's mm. old just you know uh, change it out mm. you know throw things out uh, yeah. in fact i should do that on my website a little bit there's some <laughs> stuff that's that's 10 years old they yeah thrown away um so yeah that's just a good practice to have mm. you know and, and this uh, and i was going to say as well on the subject to um like the way studios close or the way studios have been treated artists lately i mean i know you might not have not the conversation but i know there's a couple of guys and then they should just now are talking about how they're trying to basically create a movement, I think, especially in America and towards California and LA, where they're trying to unionize the 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 fleet of two D artists that are in the industry just now. Um, because obviously the the old acronym is that if you're in a studio and you don't want to work overtime, you don't want to work weekends, or you don't want to do certain things, people will say that's yeah. great. But there's ten artists at the back. You want your job, so um, exactly. I mean, how do you feel um, about? unionizing especially with artists currently um i know there's two schools of thought one is it's great because it protects people and their families and the other thought is mostly i think with a lot of the movie guys that that unionization or unions in those places creates a stagnation and maybe lazier artists that are get kind of too comfortable um yeah so i mean and this is no um slam on on some of the artists out there but i i see this some of the concept art that leaks through on just like live action movies, I am like, wow, that is bad. <laughs> you know? uh, I, or, or, or maybe this person, like you said, was picked in a studio, was the, sort of the best artist at the time mm-hmm. 20 years ago, and he's yeah. still d- pumping things out, and his name is known and mm-hmm. or whatever. That's fine. I'm really excited for that person. Mm-hmm. He's got a great career. Mm-hmm. But uh, but there's the quality of art out there is just so competitive and so amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you see like a high-level level movie and you look at their concept art and it's just like bashed together really fast with some flares or something and yeah and uh and you're i'm just i'm just dumbfounded so um i think you're right maybe the, maybe the the unionization has stagnated things a little bit um yeah. and plus it's a lot harder to get in on gigs i mean uh i've i've gotten into situations where someone contacts me and they're like, we're so excited to work with you hey um are you union Oh yeah, I said, I said no, I'm not, and they're all oh, well. We're, we're not prepared to go through the hoops of getting you on uh, in a union, so yeah. I'm sorry, it's not going to work out. I'm like, oh man, <laughs> you know, that would have been a great thing to do. Uh, yeah. We're gone. So it, yeah, it, it's got its roadblocks for sure. Because yeah. um, I think that's that's an exclusive thing, especially I think in Los Angeles that you need to be part of the union workers to get involved in projects in certain studios. Um, I think the only loophole for that was Lucas because. Up until Disney bought them, Lucas was an independent studio, so they didn't have to use unionized people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, 
part of the downfall to that a little bit was that there, I mean, uh, at the time their wages were were good, but they weren't amazing. And yeah. uh, I think there was this, you know, this cloud over the company where it's just an honor to be there, and it was mm-hmm. absolutely a hundred percent dream yeah. job. But mm-hmm. um, uh, I think they. In some cases, some companies can kind of abuse that a little bit and just yeah. say, "Hey, you know, we're we're only paying you this much. You know, there's another person down the line that will take your spot if you're not happy here." So, yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, but there's, I, I, there's. I mean, there's a lot of positives to working. To that. I, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of positive working as an artist in this industry. Definitely, I mean, people who are listening. Don't let us get you down. It's it's a great industry to work in, and the people in it are amazing. But um, yeah. I think it's just having that awareness that studios can as we say in scotland take the piss where <laughs> you basically <laughs> you get offered a dream you know you know say like somebody comes to you with the next star wars project or whatever you know the, the biggest movie coming out and they say oh you know you you get to do this and this and this and you get to this amazing opportunity to work in this film but we're only going to pay you like you know you know a hundred dollars less per year daily you know you're, you're right yeah so and then you're kind and of thinking no, and, no, and, and, and no benefits yeah um, yes so sometimes, no, no, sometimes they'll slap no or no medical benefits or something yeah um or they'll hire you on in-house and you're uh, on contract. And yeah. uh, so you're actually going to work every day. You're actually mm-hmm. getting a paycheck, mm-hmm. but you don't get all the benefits because you're working in-house as a contractor, not a full-time uh, person. And uh, obviously there's um, financial reasons why they do that. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you have to just weigh the pros and the cons. Yeah. So, And you know. if you, I mean, you could probably speak to it better than most people because the bulk of your career now, or at least the last, you know, seven or eight years has been, working contract or freelance yes. have, you, have you missed the perks that come with studio work or do you find that you've been able to cope you know because yeah, medical- i've i've had a long journey on that process um yeah. i've gone through years where it's been really tough i've gone through years that have been really good um uh i've worked on some big movies i've worked on some really crappy projects uh yeah. i think the worst one ever um uh, real quick, not to not to sideline the conversation here, was yeah. uh, a med- medical uh, animation company, and they wanted me to illustrate the inside of a woman's uh, va- uh, vagina, right. <laughs> <laughs> and to try and show how this drug worked inside the their their body. So right. it was just funny. My my wife gave me a lot of uh, uh, slack for that. Um, well, way to go! You're doing really good, you know. Um, uh, so you you take what you can get, obviously freelance, and mm-hmm. whatever pays the bills, you know. So, um, but uh, it's it's you really have to be a business. You really have to have a business hat while you're freelancing. You have to constantly be um, on the hunt for the next project. Um, like more recently, I caught wind of a movie that's being made, and I knew some people that were working on it, and. Uh, I reached out to them and uh, refreshed their memory that I'm still out here. Mm. Uh, someone also said, hey, um, people probably think you're just too busy all the time. You should just let everyone know that um, you're available. You mm-hmm. know, and, and even though I am working really hard on for a client right now, I'm mm-hmm. still available. I can yeah. shift things around. I can um, you know, adjust my schedule. Um, so you have to do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, it also really helps to be married. Or have yeah. a part that uh, is working too. So, like my wife, she she I will admit she makes more than me. Um, yeah, and and it helps. And uh, when I have a bad month, she's you know. But in a marriage or whatever, it it changes. She has a yeah. bad month. I have a good month. Whatever. She works on commission. I work on commission. So we're both in the same boat. Yeah. Um. She's obviously not an artist. Not obviously, but uh, <laughs> I, you know, she just is mm-hmm. not an artist. And um. Uh, so anyway, yeah, and then benefits wise, I get my you know insurance through her her company, and that's really helped out. So I don't have to you know uh, go through a different channel that way. But, the, but whatever, it, it, everyone's journey is different on that level, and uh, it's just worked. This it's worked out for me. So. Yeah, I mean, so the ultimate question is though: are, are you definitely enjoying the freelance gig, or do you think you might down the line try to go back into studio work? Or oh, you... great question, uh, Gordon. Yeah. yeah um, I if the right project came across my desk and it was in the bay area mm-hmm. i would definitely consider uh working um on on, a, on another studio project um uh right now my my goals are set to uh finish some big personal projects of mine and uh hopefully that will get me back into the studio uh in the next you know four to six years i'd say yeah, so yeah. 
Um, I'm I, I, I landed a, a book deal with uh, Chronicle Books. They're a, a pretty well-known uh, publishing house. And uh, I, I pitched them my fantasy adventure series, and they picked it up. Mm-hmm. And I'm working with a writer, and uh, it's chock full of illustrations. And it's been a process that's been going on for four years now. <laughs> it's, a really, it's really hard to develop an original IP with, um, with uh, you know, a, a publisher. They... Chronicle Books has been absolutely wonderful. They've mm. been really um, uh, helpful, yeah. and uh, it's just it's it's just challenging, and 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 that's what it should be if you're yeah. going to try and create a really uh, a special story. So anyway, that's that's something I'm working on, and hopefully that will get me into the studio down the road. Yeah. That project yeah. develops. Yeah. So, I mean, it's good as well, though, because I think if you have ideas in your head, it, there's so many avenues now to self-publish. I mean. One of my friends from Edinburgh, actually, she's uh, as our kind of last year project and fourth year, she made a children's book, um, which I think was The Boy in the Hat or The Wizard in the Hat, and uh, very, really good illustrations, and she kick-started it um, and got it funded, so she was able to publish all the books to all the backers, along with some bonus art and stuff, and then just recently... Um, the book got picked up by an American publisher who are now wanting to publish the book overseas. Um, wow. Yeah, but she started that whole journey herself just by um, jumping on Kickstarter and, and, and publishing the book that way. So um, Amazing, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I self-published my art book, uh, Fantastical, The Art of Matt Gazer. I, uh, I set out... So that's another facet of what I've been up to is comic conventions. And yeah. um, this is something I actually wish I had done a, uh, 10 years prior previous um i got into the circuit about four years ago yeah and uh it was because i had to try and sell my book (laughs) and um and uh turned out uh well it started out i was trying to sell my prints and Mm -hmm. everyone was asking me hey you need you need a book of your work uh we'd buy it off of you and so i went to my friend ian morris at cameron and company uh Mm -hmm. Uh, and he's a, a a pretty very successful uh, book layout artist. He's done like the Kung, art of Kung Fu Panda, the art of trolls, like mm-hmm. art of Star Wars, uh, or the encyclo- or Star Wars encyclopedia. He's mm-hmm. done all sorts of books, mm-hmm. and they have his. They, he's now partnered with this guy, and they they have their own company. And um, so I, I originally I was going to do a forty page little book, uh, you know, paperback, and mm-hmm. Ian pushed me super hard to do a hundred twenty page. Uh, 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 hard cover with dust jacket and full oh. color and everything else. And <laughs> obviously, with that, the, it became more expensive, um, vastly more expensive. But mm-hmm. um, I, I had it down to where I, I only had to sell like 315 units to make the money back, and that wasn't too hard to do. So, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, self publishing um, can 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 be really liberating. You don't have to go by anyone else's rules. You're the one that is running that project and you can publish whatever you want so yeah definitely and i think it's it's the same to talk about um people who have used like um like photoshop for years as well that you know you only have to use this one thing and this is how you get in the industry but then there's so many more tools out there now that are are, are matching or, or surpassing photoshop in its own rights um and, well, like uh, pro pro procreate you were talking about yeah uh, yeah. I, yeah funny you mentioned that matt <laughs> I know nice the se- segue. Nice the, segue, right? The, the segue is <laughs> discreet, but as discreet as a brick through a glass window. But um, yeah, so I mean, obviously, uh, you guys know, um, and this um, actually is the first episode where we get to announce this because uh, this has been a long time coming. But Matt is the first guest where we talk about how we are sponsored by uh, Procreate. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a massive announcement. Um, so now we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for Digital Artcast. That's Procreate. Procreate is an Apple Design award-winning digital painting and illustration solution designed exclusively for iOS. Uh, with Procreate, it allows you to create professional-grade artworks wherever you are, with an advanced dual texture brush engine, uh, a robust layering system, and a groundbreaking canvas resolution, all for five ninety nine. That's in UK. Um, you can find Procreate through the App Store on your iPad, or learn more at Procreate.art. So yeah, we're sponsored by Procreate. Um, for guys who don't know, um, it's the most advanced painting app uh, ever designed for a mobile device. You might know if you've used it. Um, you know, it's one of these things where it's you know actually been award-winning on the Apple design front, where it's won numerous awards, uh, especially on the iPad Pro because it was a huge launch for that. But it was way before the iPad Pro launched; it was getting used. Um, you know, and it actually is is almost a professional tool to the point where you know you would you could physically. Um, use the app without having to 
go anywhere near Photoshop or any other apps because it's it has so many features built in it. I mean, there's a guy I was talking to Matt about this yesterday, Nikolai Lockerstein, who has basically built his entire career off using the Procreate app. Um, even before the iPad Pro and Pencil came out, he was just using the basic iPad with a, a basic stylus that came, I think, uh, you know, two or three dollars, um, and he's built an amazing portfolio of work just using that. Um, I mean, in Procreate has some great things. I mean, it comes packed with like 128 brushes. You can use up to a 16K canvas. It's incorporated layers. If you have a Bluetooth keyboard, it works with keyboard shortcuts. Um, you know, and then obviously if you're using the iPad Pencil and um, the iPad Pro, then obviously that just makes it, you know, a pretty much one-to-one -one experience almost, you know, uh, on level with Wacom's Cintiq um, products as well. You can stream through the app now they just recently released that so you can actually use procreate and you can stream to several different sites at once um and use the app that way if you want to stream to facebook or to twitch or to any other things that you can set that up within the app it also screen records so you can actually um you can draw or paint in the app and then automatically it will capture that and then at the end of your painting you can press a button and basically it replays the whole experience of you painting start to finish um, I like that. That sounds really great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Matt obviously looked at the the website yesterday. He was saying he loved the idea. Yeah, I I'm going to just, uh, download it. I'm actually going on vacation uh, to Hawaii uh, this this weekend, so I'm going to um, I'm going to put it on my iPad, and I have a, a stylus, and I'm I'm actually going to try and do some landscape digital landscape painting on that, and mm. uh, maybe next go around we can share that or whatever. But yeah. uh, I'll be using Procreate, so I'm I'm excited to try it out. Yeah, definitely. And uh, guys who are listening here, we have an offer for the guys who are listening to the podcast in, in any sense. Um, but if you're specifically on YouTube, um, if you guys would like, comment and subscribe to the podcast, I'll be picking a random winner and uh, someone will be getting a free copy of Procreate in the next week or two uh, once I get the codes back and we pick a winner. So uh, if you guys are listening just now to the interview with Matt and myself, um, like, comment and subscribe on the channel and we will organise a free code for a random winner so you guys can uh, can use Procreate. So, yeah. Thanks very much awesome. to Procreate for sponsoring us. It's great that they're, uh, they've they got involved with the podcast now. And, uh, and yeah, so... Um, that's really cool, Gordon. That's yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. To be sponsored is a big deal. Yeah, so. definitely. So I'm, I'm, I'm super happy at the guys across there that have... Uh, They've managed to put their faith in me to to run with the the, the brand as well as as well as my own one. So yeah, big thanks yeah. to the guys at Procreate. Um, all the way over in Australia. So yeah. So Matt, you have talked about the industry, how you got started, um, the way you feel about it just now. But um, you know, most people will be always asking, you know, what you feel it takes to get a job in the industry um maybe a, a a bit different for you now because um you're not art directing full-time or you, you're not based on a full-time studio but if people were looking to get into a studio maybe even now as maybe compared to your experience when you first got your first job how how do you think's the best way to go about that um specifically for 2d art I honestly would have, I mean, if I was starting out now, if like, let's say I just wanted to go up get back into studio, um, uh, position as a concept artist, I would, um, and I, let's pretend I didn't have any contacts. Um, I first, first thing I do is, is just really, um, mine, uh, LinkedIn, uh, yeah. and, and, um, Make a make a really good long list of all the companies I, I want to work for, work for. If I'm willing to move, then that list would be even longer. If I want to, if I want to specifically stay in a region like L.A. or New York or Chicago or uh, San Francisco Bay Area, mm -hmm. I I would uh, make a laundry list of companies just in that area. Yeah, and uh, I would seek out and build a contact base on LinkedIn. Mm. Uh, from uh, and develop a, a network of people um, that I'm I'm uh, at a first contact basis mm -hmm. uh, with uh, in that in that group, and just start um, making that 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 leap for 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 generating contacts. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you really need to have a good presentation um, that can be either on Instagram. That can be that's the easiest these mm -hmm. days is Instagram, obviously, mm -hmm. but. Um, uh, if you can either code yourself or if you can afford to develop a website, I think um, that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people really visit my website anymore, and I'm actually considering doing an app. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think there's some great um, 
tools out there for just developing an app uh, on the cheap. And that's another great way if maybe an art director could develop it or just download a free version of your work on, through an app and they can experience your world and your art uh, through that. That's a kind of a progressive new way to try and uh, develop a presentation. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And then, and then just start researching co- which companies need, need artists and, and just uh, uh, go through the channels, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I mean, uh, it, uh, one thing that's been really successful for me is contacting an art director at a company at LinkedIn, sending them a link. To, once I'm connected with them, sending them a link to my website, mm-hmm. and I'm so confident with my presentation on my website that I let that try and do the rest. I, yeah. Nine times out of ten, they say, "Hey, uh, beautiful work. Yeah, um, we don't have any work right now, but uh, we'll keep you in mind." Mm-hmm. Then I have a. Um, I have an Excel sheet of like everyone that has either said they liked my work mm-hmm. or has said, uh, you know, check back in three months or whatever. And I, I make sure to do that. And I go back to my list and I, and I methodically go through everyone, uh, you know, and I rotate mm-hmm. uh, every three to six months. And uh, so, so, yeah, if you're starting out, that might be a little uh, quite of an undertaking, but mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's worked for me mm-hmm. and um, it could work for you. Yeah. And then, uh, and like I said, mobile gaming companies. Honestly, uh, if your portfolio is um, is is not the best it could be, and it still needs needs some 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 polishing, then I would go with the mobile gaming studios because the, the requirement for art quality is not as high as say Pixar or DreamWorks. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, and you can definitely be more successful uh, getting a job that way. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and also there's um on the newer side of it for uh, probably my generation that's coming up for working through concept now. Um, ArtStation is a a huge thing now. Um, yeah. I mean, I even spoke to um, Shady who runs One Pixel Brush in LA, and he was saying that when people submit work to him now, he just looks for their ArtStation link, um, and he just sights through that. And because ArtStation posts jobs for the industry every single day, and there's always up to you know thirty forty jobs per page. Um, they seem to be the kind of actual the. I know what you're saying with LinkedIn, but I, th- I think it's make a, there's a shift paradigm now where I think more and more people now just build a career in ArtStation, and people are seen through that. Um, I know even that's Leonard, really great. Yeah, I mean Leonard and his team as well who run it. Um, they've recently launched launched ArtStation Pro, so I think for like I think it's like six bucks a month, they basically turn your ArtStation into a website that has its own URL, and you can just amazing. Yeah, send that off to art directors or, or people, and uh, yeah, even working at Axis, I know there's a time they were looking for people. They would they would go through ArtStation a lot, or they would look through the trending page at the front. You know, where, which artwork was trending, and try and look at some of the yeah. you know the bigger artists, and and, and then contact them through because um, ArtStation has a hire me button, so you just press it, and it automatically sends an email to the guy saying you know we're interested in you, would like <laughs> you to work with us. So yeah, I mean it's it's. I think it's just it's even easier now for people to get noticed. Um, oh, big time! Yeah, yeah there's there, there's entire forums just devoted to uh, you know promoting your work. Yeah, and, oh, definitely. Uh, yeah, but I mean, without de- you having to do the heavy lifting, so yeah, just, it does. It tries to do it. You know, it, the the art if it's if it's successful enough, will do it for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people so. always uh, people always talk about how they they try to go online and find jobs, and they've never got any luck. But I've always found with especially some of the more successful guys that. If you make good enough art, then people will come to you. Um, if they have an inclination of, you know, as long as your stuff isn't lost in the burial of the internet, you know, then it's uh, it's impossible to find. But if you, if you're more or less presentable on the internet through Facebook or something, or even ArtStation, then um, if your stuff's good enough, then people will will definitely come flocking to you. Um, um, as the old saying yeah, goes, if yeah. if you build it, they will come. So, yeah. Yeah, and and um, I you know the the. The general rule of thumb starting out is to have a portfolio that is um, uh, that is diverse and and has all, a lot of different styles and st- and things like that. But um, I I go I I run from the train of thought that if you have an original look to your work mm-hmm. and it's very unique and uh, and shares a side of imagination and creativity that is. Uh, that is is sort of foreign to people. That th- there's also a market out there for that. It's very. Yeah. Uh, it's very specific, mm. but uh, but you you can find work that way too, you know. Yeah. And and honestly, if your work is just good, it's flat mm. out good, mm. uh, a lot of people can see can picture your your skill set on on many projects. That's not um, 
being represented in your portfolio. Yeah. And I think that's a very successful art director that can do that. I, mm. A lot of people will, the, the case is, you know, oh, okay, we're doing a, a medieval uh, a project with some hints of sci fi, but your stuff is all like, whimsical and fantasy and um you know and and they won't hire you because there's no hard surface objects in your yeah uh, in your portfolio um uh sometimes they'll ask you to do a test and that's fine too you just gotta knock it out of the park but mm. um uh other times they go you know what this guy's really good let's hire him let's let's give him a shot that, yeah. that does that that does happen yeah so i mean like one of the the biggest gigs especially freelance because they contract so many people out as as wizards of the coast using uh, Magic the Gathering. Um, I mean, that's a, a huge thing, and and people would say that they always try to earn their portfolio towards that because it's the top tier echelon. But I think that puts fear, especially for me. I know specifically that growing up, um, being into comic books and LA kids TV shows like Turtles and He Man, where I tend to be drawn towards a more stylized look for my work. But I think for the last, it was only recently I kind of like had this revelation. But the last couple of years, I was trying to almost forced my hand into that style because I wanted to have that that look, that appeal that most people have but still then I was like well this isn't really what I mean what I want to do and you know and, and people are saying oh with the stylized work you'll never get work but then a lot of the stylized guys I know basically are going towards Blizzard because they have a huge demand for that work um, because I'll so does know. League of Legends Le uh, their style is all over the place yeah in um, uh, from, an from anime to uh uh, just comic book, video game style, stuff, yeah. video game. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. Because so, one uh, of their uh, one of their main character guys just now is a guy called Alvin Lee. I don't know if you know Alvin at all. Mm. So Alvin, Alvin was uh, for years and years was a comic book artist. He worked exclusively with Marvel and DC. He done a lot of Spider Man runs, um, a lot of you know stuff with Batman, and uh, has he basically moved his entire comic career over to working for League of Legends. Um so he consults now on all of their characters because obviously he was drawing all of these these characters at the time and then I think it's the process because a comic artist I think have to have to have the extra polish in their line work so his stuff was so clean it just fitted. And then Alvin obviously is one of the new generations of comic artists where he's mixed a lot of Eastern style with Western. So his his comic book drawn style was like half anime, half Western comics. Um, wow. so yeah, so he's working up at, at Riot just now but um, yeah, it's it's basically as a, as a front to say that it doesn't matter what your style is, whatever it is, you'll always if you're good enough, you'll always find work. Um, yeah, absolutely. And um, there's there's always projects out there that will match your what you're into, and you can try and seek those out as well. Video games, uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think um, for the animated film, uh, uh, you know, industry, it's um, really geared towards this Mary Blair style of, yeah. um, of, of concept art. Mm. Um, oddly enough, I don't get a lot of gigs in the animation film oriented, uh, space. Uh, you'd think I would, but, yeah. uh, I, there's this trend right now in portfolios where it's gotta be really graphic and edgy and very Mary Blair. I think, yeah. uh, for those of you don't, who don't know Mary Blair, she was, a um, an illustrator that worked for Disney back in the day, back when Walt Disney was alive and helped develop the look for small world and uh, a lot of their rides back in the day. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, it's resonated with a lot of artists and, uh, and it's really successful right now. Um, yeah. it's their, their work is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just, I have a very different style. It's very painterly and, and, and kind of messy in, in, in ways. And the, I don't think they're really looking for that as much right now. Maybe when that, when that style changes, maybe that's when I'll be back in demand. Um, yeah. uh, but Cause, uh, cause I, mean, it, I, I work on those type of projects yeah. and they do come across my desk, but I don't, I don't exclusively work in, in that space for that reason. I yeah. Think. Yeah. And I think that like you said, there's trends. So there's trends of when art, a particular style art is more in favor and then that lands you the gig and then it changes. So you go to different stuff, but um, yeah. Obviously, like one of the biggest things that came across your desk in the last couple of years was working um, with Rovio and the guys um, that done you know the Angry Birds movie because um, you were heavily involved in a lot of the the visual development. Look at that. Um, quite yeah. Early on. And, yeah, and then actually that project again was a really funny uh, experience because um, if you look at my website, a vast majority of it is all vibrant color work mm. um and they exclusively uh, hired me on to do uh design sketches and drawings so i 
I think it was for like a course of eight months. I just developed uh, the Bird Island and the Pig Island uh, early on um, with the directors and uh, and just <laughs> had a lot of fun sketching all day. And uh, uh, they're working on the second one coming up. Uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. So, but um, but uh, as far as I know, um, it's very very early on in the process. Well, yeah. But I, I don't. I really don't know anything about it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. Um, it's funny because that's that's again a, a case I think where they saw my creativity and they'd rather use it in a different way and yeah. uh, and then you know in some cases you get other other clients where they're like um, well we actually have an artist that's already done layout we just want you to paint over the layouts and just yeah. do the paint part mm. so uh, it, it just changes constantly you know it yeah. just depends on how how they see a, a need for you yeah because so. obviously we Angry Birds coming from like the mobile game background there wasn't apart from some of the initial two D art that they used for the game. The world wasn't really developed at all, so that left you quite a, a scope to, yeah, insanely uh, create creative, yeah. And um, my producer um, was a type of guy that just so when I got on the project, there was no directors. the The script was being finalized, and uh, there wasn't a production designer. Uh, and I, I had a contact that uh, introduced me to this this fellow who was producing it, and so um, I worked with him. And for the first four months, it was just back and forth, trying different things, experimenting. Uh, and I think the Pig Island was the most fun, just because um, I love sh- cube cube oriented uh, environments, and it was very um, hard surface, weird um, blocky shapes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and trying to develop the pig world uh, with all these funky supports and using, um, you know, rocks and and TNT boxes to uh, hold them up. It was just a total dream to to yeah. explore. So, I mean, obviously, I think it was a success as well because um, like the movie was hilarious. Like, I actually watched the movie thinking I wasn't. Exp- I didn't really know what to expect, but you know, coming from a, a game, you know, I thought there's not going to be a great foundation to build on. But the movie was hilarious. Like, I really loved it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean it was um it was a fun film. I you know, it's not the greatest one that was ever out there, but oh, it yeah, definitely yeah. Made a lot of money cuz obviously the the franchise is so so well popular, known. Popular, yeah. Yeah, and obviously the movie was was incredibly beautiful. Not not cuz I hell, I worked on that. I honestly have uh huge props for the for the production designer uh, Pete Oswald. Uh he 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 basically crafted the the final look for everything and uh, and he did an amazing job and uh and and yeah, so that that's just a, a case in point of having the right people in place. I think that the 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 coolest part about that working on that project, the the coolest part was seeing the final product, seeing the art book. Mm-hmm. Uh, although a lot of my work didn't make it into the art book, which is fine. Uh, seeing how other artists uh, evolve the pro the, the art that I had first started, and mm-hmm. and seeing where it went after I had initially lit the spark on some things. Yeah. Um, and, and seeing the seeds of what I helped create in the mm-hmm. final look, uh, that was just a, something I, I really had never experienced before. Um, and it was a lot of fun to see that. Yeah. So. Awesome. So for people who don't know, um, kind of like going forward, where are you in the next year? Do you have anything kind of big and exciting coming up? Or Obviously, probably you can't talk about a lot of it, but is there something that you've got your eye on or think you'd like to do? Or um... Yeah, um, I... So, I'm hugely involved in this comic book circuit. Uh, I mean, comic convention yeah. circuit, and um, uh, I am always generating new material for that. Um, I'm actually working on a my first toy. It's going to be a resin toy. It's going to sit uh, eight inches tall. Wow! Um, and it's going to be uh, the design is really fun. I finalized the design. I found a company that's going to make it for me, and uh, nice. the, the people that made my book are going to do the packaging. Oh, wow. And I'm completely self-funding it. I'm going to only do 200 of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I'm really excited because I, I have a, a huge uh, collection of toys and art toys. And I, I, I just want to – I've always wanted to make my own. So this is a trial run mm-hmm. to see if this is going to go anywhere. Um, so – and then on top of that, it's just that art book – or the uh, – excuse me, the uh, Fantasy Adventure series. Uh, that's – I'm just 100 percent full steam on that right now mm-hmm. and with my writer and trying to get – uh, the book completely done by uh, Christmas uh, in in rough form, so that I can spend all next year uh, polishing it. Cool. So, yeah. And then, uh, are you looking to get involved in any kind of um, other stuff that external from your personal work? Is there stuff you're doing for? Yes. Or- 
Yes, um, DreamWorks, something com- potentially coming up with that. Cool. Um, uh, very exciting, actually. And nice. uh, and then uh, potentially, I, I, I can't say, but there's another studio um, that I might, I might... I'm not trying to just keep people in the fog. No, no, there's, no. Always, there's, always, there's always things that are coming yeah. towards me, mm-hmm. and then they fall through, and you just never know what's, what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Yeah. Um, Nothing too. Oh, I, I will be starting the Daydream Festival for next year uh, uh, in June, which is cool. tomorrow. <laughs> I, not literally starting the project tomorrow, but in June I'm starting that again. And I, that's another thing where I look forward to the poster so much because it's so highly imaginative in 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 the world that, that I've created for them. So uh, they give me a like a word like typewriter or uh, magical lantern was last year's. Um, the year before that it was a compass. And and literally, I have to generate an entire visual world based on that, and uh, and it's a huge challenge, and it's a lot of fun, and so that's something. Excuse me, that I'll be uh, working on here in the next uh, several months. Awesome, awesome, cool. And then uh, for people who want to follow your work, or they want to get in touch, or you know your presence online. Where can they find yeah, you? Yeah, I'd, I'd say um, Facebook is dying, although it's very uh, useful. <laughs> um, I do have a Facebook page. Just look up my name, Matt Gazer. Uh, last name is spelled G-A-S-E-R. Uh, two T's with Matt. And um, I'm not a floor Matt. Um, <laughs> and uh, Instagram, just look up my name as well on Instagram. I've, uh, I'm very uh, active on that. Uh, mm-hmm. Almost every day I post something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, obviously my website, just Matt, mattgazer.com. Cool. So there you go, and then uh, obviously the last plug is Bell. Your book is still available. Yeah, I think you're, not, still you're available you're... on on Amazon. Uh, the fantastical, the art of Matt Gazer, um, that that can be purchased uh, through Amazon. But if you want to uh, get a special copy that has a drawing inside of it, through you can get that through my web my website. I have a cool. store. Cool. So yeah, how much is your your book again? Is it twenty five dollars? Uh, my book is thirty. 30. Um, cool. Uh, not to undermine the sale of my book on my website, but you can get it much cheaper on Amazon uh, as, as almost anything these days. Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, yeah. yeah. And then obviously uh, I post uh, on Facebook and, and Instagram whenever I'm doing a, a comic uh, convention. And I, I, I generally keep it on the Pacific Northwest. So all the way yeah. up to Seattle, all the way down to Burbank. Mm-hmm. That whole uh, region is Portland. I'm doing a, a comic convention in Portland in uh, September. That's my next one. Right. So. Yeah, and that'll have copies of your book and prints. Yeah, and... Cop- yeah. And actually, I'm doing a limited version of that uh, book um, with a clamshell and two limited prints. And there's, oh, I'm only going to be offering 200 of those as well. Wow. And that will be available here in the next couple months. So. Right. Okay. Grand. Okay. Well, um, just finally just to thank you Matt for coming on and speaking to me it's been a pleasure as always um, oh, my pleasure too Gordon thank yeah, you hope you enjoyed it um, yeah guys stay tuned to the podcast we'll have a lot more interviews coming up um, again thanks to my sponsor uh, Procreate um, and uh, obviously check back and like subscribe and comment on the video if you guys want to win a free code for Procreate that'll be coming up uh, I'll pick a random winner and get in contact with you through YouTube um, ASAP And uh, yeah, stay tuned for more great stuff and uh, we'll see you guys later. Thanks again. Bye.